Uh, well, hey again, everybody. It is so great uh, to be with you and just sharing uh, my heart this morning. Uh, so thankful uh, for Pastor uh, Pastor Crabtree, just for the opportunity uh, again. You know, it says a lot about our senior pastor who gives uh, young guys like Pastor Phil last week, our worship pastor, and, and myself. Uh, and I like to think that I'm young, but um, just young guys like ourselves, uh, young preachers that um, uh, just uh, that have a, a passion to do what he does. And so we're just so thankful for Pastor for giving us that opportunity. So uh, just to be with you. So this morning, uh, I want to talk to you on the topic of together. Together. Everybody say that with me. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Together. This past week, I came across a story on the power of together. And it goes like this. Uh, at a Midwestern fair, many spectators gathered for an old-fashioned horse pull an event where various weights are put on a horse-drawn sled and pulled along the ground. Sounds exciting, right? The grand champion horse pulled a sled with 4,500 pounds on it. That was the first place horse. The, the, the runner-up, second place, right, was close with 4,400 uh, 4, pounds that that horse pulled. So men being men, wondered what the, two, uh, what the two horses could pull if hitched together. So think about it. Separately, they totaled nearly 9,000 pounds that they pulled individually, right? So you would think that at least they would pull 9,000. But when hitched and working together, the horses, as a team, they pulled over 12,000 pounds. The reason I give you that story or, or the point I want to get across is this, that together people can accomplish more together than separate. People can accomplish more together than separately. This morning, I, I want to talk to you on, on the subject or the power of together. So I want you to, to uh, look at your neighbor right now, pick a neighbor to your left or to the right and tell them this, we are in this together. Come on. Now go to your second choice, your other neighbor, all right, and tell them the same thing. Tell them we are in this together. We are in this together. The American Sociological Review did a study on friendship here in America, and they discovered that, the, that most Americans uh, in, in that study uh, had two close friends, okay, that most Americans would say that they have two close friends but the interesting thing that the study also found out was that 25% of Americans, now think about that number, out of all the people that live in America, right? That 25% of Americans don't even have one close friend. And so let's, that lets me know that, that we live in a culture, maybe not just in America, but in the world, with a lot of relational poverty. And you may not understand what that means because maybe you've never heard that term before. Because look, you, you can understand material poverty, right? We, we all have seen people who are homeless. Uh, we, we've either, either been on a missions trip or seen a commercial uh, where people that, uh, um, uh, for, or people asking you know, people for money because there's people in, in this world, kids that don't have clean drinking water or food before they go to bed. And so we can understand material poverty. We can wrap our mind around that. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, you can also wrap your mind around uh, spiritual poverty, right? You, you can understand that, that, that we know that there's a lot of people in this world that just don't, you know, believe in God, don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in Jesus, don't go to church, don't want anything to do with religion. So, so again, look, we can understand material poverty, and we can also understand spiritual poverty. But then there's this third type of poverty, and that's relational poverty that most of us experience. And you see, God knew. God knew that we would struggle relationally from time to time. Now, though many do struggle relationally, if we were honest with ourselves this morning, the truth is that, that, that some of us are, you know, introverts, some of us are, are extroverts, and so for some of us it's easier to just kind of do life alone than, than, than others. But regardless of where you fall in that spectrum, that if you're really honest with yourself, nobody wants to do life alone. 
right? Nobody, nobody says that, that nobody would, would stand up and say, yeah, you know what? Uh, I want to have dinner by myself every night. I, I don't want anybody checking on me. I don't want nobody to call me on my birthday. I don't want to have a family. I don't want my kids to, to, to come back, you know, home after college. Like, like none of us would want to do life alone, even if we're introverts. If we were really honest, at the end, that if uh, we end up at the end of our life one day, none of us want to look back at our lives and just live a life alone with nobody coming to see us. And so there's this relational poverty that a lot of us are experiencing because, look, God created us for relationship. And so, again, regardless of who you are, whether if you're a follower of Jesus or not, you know that you were created for relationship. That's why people love getting married, right? That's why you have so many best friends because we were just created for community. And it was God who established that inside of us, that longing to get married or that longing for, for friendship, that longing to, to, to be part of something, to belong somewhere. That pattern was established by God because God knew that we would struggle relationally. And so this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus, we're gonna look at this pattern and my hope and my prayer for you is that you will understand that you can't do faith alone. That you're not meant to do faith alone. Now for those of you who, who are maybe new to church this morning, or, or maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe somebody invited you to church for the very first time. That means they care enough about you to invite you to church, which is what we're talking about today, community. But regardless of, of where you are, maybe this is your first time in church in a long time. Maybe you're struggling in your faith. My, my hope and my prayer is that, that if you decide to come back, that, or if you decide to take a leap of faith and give your life to Jesus one day, that you would know that you can't do life alone, that your faith will not be sustained alone. And so this morning, I want to start off by seeing this principle in the life of Jesus. And so would you go with me? to Luke chapter 7, and that's where we're going to begin. And, and before we get there, let, let, me, let me set this up, okay? So take, you can take a few minutes to, to, put, uh, to find Luke chapter 7 or pull it up on your iPhone or iPad. We'll be there in just a, about 30 seconds. So let me set this up. So we, we know why Jesus came, or, or most of us would, would know how to answer that question, why Jesus came. And, and the Bible says, and out of Jesus' own mouth, he said, I came for the, for the sick, not the healthy that Jesus came to die, that he came to reestablish that, that relationship that was, broken, that was broken a long time in the Garden of Eden and back in Genesis, that, that Jesus came to die so that we can have a relationship with God again. And so we can, we can understand that, right? And why answers the, the, the question, um, for what purpose? For what purpose did Jesus come? And that was, it was to die for us. But have you ever wondered how he came? Now, how, how answers a different question than why? How answers by what means or in what manner did he come? And Luke tells us that. And Luke chapter 7 tells us how he came. Because many of us would think, okay, well, he came preaching, teaching, and healing. And, and those answers are right. But we're going to see something in Jesus that maybe we never noticed before. And we're going re- to find out today how important, how crucial it is for your spiritual development. So Luke chapter 7 is on the screen, starting at verse 33 and 34. It says this, uh, For John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, it says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. Okay, and, and let me just take a step back. Jesus is having a conversation here with the religious leaders, okay? He's having an argument. He's saying, for, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon, and the Son of Man, talking about himself, came eating and drinking, and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so here, Luke tells us how Jesus came. Here, Luke tells us that Jesus loved to do life with people. It tells us here that Jesus loved to eat. Like Jesus loved a good potluck lunch. Jesus loved a good barbecue. He loved Taco Tuesdays with his disciples. He just loved getting invited to parties. That's who Jesus was. Now here this morning, you may have just realized that maybe you have more in common with Jesus than you realized before you came in. Jesus just loved hanging out with people. 
And he was accused, he, 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 was, he was eating and hanging out and being invited to parties so much and hanging out with shady, pe- with shady people so much that he was accused of eating too much and drinking too much. And listen, the reason Jesus loved a good party, the reason why Jesus loved breaking bread with people, it wasn't just because he was hungry, though I'm sure that was, that was part of it. Not just because he liked, you know, hanging out with his disciples or because he felt bad saying no to uh, an invitation to a wedding. But listen, for Jesus, it was more. It was more than just a meal. It was more than just a party that he was getting invited to. Because you see, and back in Bible times, meals and getting together was more than just for survival. It was more than just survival. In his, uh, in his book, Breaking Bread Together, Min Q Lee says this, he says, the action of, uh, he says the action of the breaking of bread represented three meanings in a social perspective back in Bible times. It meant, it meant these three things. And I want you to remember these three things as we talk, um, as we continue in our talk. It meant these three things. Number one, the end of hostility. Number two, the making of a covenant. And number three, the formation of community. You see, meals created identity. And he goes on to say that when they broke bread together, they remembered what God did for them and how God took care of them. That the breaking of bread together formed their religious identity. It it, it was like when they would sit down and break bread, grandpa would speak up and say, let let me tell you the time in our ancestors' lives where, where they were slaves for over 400 years and, and Jesus sent Moses, our first prophet, to, to free us from over 400 years of slavery. But let me tell you about the time where, where we were leaving Egypt and the Pharaoh and his armies were chasing us and, and we went up to this, to the Red Sea and, and we thought we were as good as dead and all of a sudden Moses prays and then the, the sea splits open and we walk on dry ground and once we pass it, the water closes up on the Egyptian army. And as they're breaking bread and as they're drinking and as they're eating, mom and dad speak up and say, let me tell you about the time that our ancestors faced the, the, their, the, their, their enemies in, at, at Jericho. And instead of shooting cannons at the walls, and instead of shooting you know, bow and arrows and launching fire over this wall, God told them to, to walk around for, for, for seven days and just worship around their complex. And at the end of seven days, they just shouted. They worshiped so loud that the, that the walls came tumbling down. Let me tell you what God did for us. Ming Yu Lee in his book continues uh, by saying this. He says, thus sharing a meal and its symbolic action, the breaking of bread is exclusive. In that any foreigner or uncircumcised person, a non-Jew, cannot be allowed to participate. This is because the breaking of bread is not just sharing in performance, but a symbolic act of formation of community and its identity. Therefore, if one shares the bread, which has a special meaning to the past, one shares the identity and is included symbolically in this perspective, the breaking of bread signifies the openness of community instead of exclusiveness. And so no wonder Jesus would hang out with shady people. No wonder he was accused of hanging out with tax collectors and sinners so much because you see, Jesus was intentional. He did it on purpose. He wasn't just saying yes to a party. It wasn't just because he was hungry. It was because every time he sat down and broke bread and got together with people, It was a foreshadowing of what he was getting ready to do on the cross. And as he broke bread with people, most likely he wasn't saying this, but in his actions he was saying this, that as we break bread, as we come together, as I hang out with you, I'm letting you know that I'm getting ready to end the hostility between you and God. That I'm getting ready to make a new, what? Covenant. Remember the Last Supper, what did Jesus say? I'm making a new covenant covenant. Jesus, as he hung out with these people, not just the disciples, but these shady people, he was inviting them to form a new community. Now listen, he wasn't condoning what they were doing, the sin that they were, that they were a part of. 
but he was inviting them to this community that was exclusive for so long. And he's saying now, because I've come now, I'm, I'm, I'm making it inclusive. And so that's why these religious leaders hated Jesus, because he was inviting them to this intimacy, to this fellowship, for them to experience, listen, the presence of God. In the Bible, Jesus is referred to as the bread of life. And bread in the Bible represented his presence. And so when they were breaking the bread, he was saying, look, I want to show you God's presence. And so this morning, this is not um, point one, but this is a point that I want to kind of get across as, as we continue in our talk. So if you're taking notes, I want you to, I want you to dot, uh, jot this down or, or make a mental note of this. We experience the presence of God best in the context of community. We're, we're going to see that we experience the presence of God best when we're together. When we're together. So we're going to look at faith through the lens of community, beginning in the book of Acts. So would you turn with me again to the book, uh, in, in your Bible, to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And again, it's going to be on the screen behind me if you, didn't, if you don't have your Bible. I'll give you a few seconds to turn to Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 40. One. So as you're, as you're turning there, let me, let me set this up for you. So, so this is post-resurrection. Jesus, Jesus has died, risen from the dead. Um, he's commissioned the disciples, the early Christians, to go out and spread the love of God, spread the way of Jesus. And then Jesus leaves and goes back to the Father. And so Peter, who denied Jesus, you remember that story? Peter got restored Pentecost happens, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches his first sermon, and 3,000 people get saved or, or come to, to follow Jesus. And so that's where we pick up in our story. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says this. Those who accepted his message, talking about Peter, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 42, and we're going to camp out here for, for a few moments. It says, they devoted themselves. Everybody say devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, which just means spending time together, and to the breaking of bread. There's that phrase again. And to prayer. So let's park there for a few moments. 3,000 people come to, to know Jesus and it says that they devoted themselves, the early disciples, these early Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we, would, we could wrap our minds around that. We would say, yeah, of course. Look, if the disciples are preaching, teaching, I'm there, right? I would love, I would have loved to hear, to have heard that message from Peter that 3,000 people came to know Jesus. So that makes sense, right? They devoted themselves to going to church, to hearing a sermon preached, but didn't stop there, I want you to notice that God could have just put a period there. That it could have just ended there, that they just devoted themselves to hearing the disciples preach week in and week out, day in and day out. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says that they were devoted, yes, to the, the preaching of God's word over them, but also to this word fellowship. And this word fellowship kind of sounds like a churchy word, but it's, it's really not. It, it, it means this. In the original language, it just means this. It means sharing, and it denotes intimacy with each other. Fellowship was a sharing of deep life and a deep connection. Like it wasn't just, I'll, I'll see you next week, or I'll see you in, at Christmas, or I'll see you at Easter, or I'll, I'll see you in a couple months at your birthday. It, it wasn't that type of fellowship. It wasn't just a lunch one day after church. It wasn't a barbecue, you know, one, one Saturday, once a month. It was this deep connection of sharing life with each other consistently and constantly. And I don't want you to miss that principle because we often do. Because for many of us, we stop at the first part, don't we? 
That as long as we get, as long as we listen to the sermon maybe online, or as long as I'm just hearing my favorite, you know, speaker's podcast, you know, as, as long as I'm, you know, worshiping um, in, in, my, in, in my quiet, you know, secret place at home to the latest Elevation CD, or as long as I'm reading my favorite, you know, preacher's, you know, latest book, then look, I'm good to go. Right? And look, there's nothing wrong with reading your favorite, you know, author. Nothing wrong with listening to your favorite preacher online. Nothing wrong with even listening to Pastor Crabtree online if you're, if you're sick or maybe you had a surgery or you're away on vacation or, or you're just sick that day. Again, nothing wrong with that. But listen, for a lot of us, that's where we stay. For us, our Christianity is just wrapped around that, that preacher or that book or that worship, you know, CD. That as long as I'm spending my quiet time, then look, I'm good to go and I'll, I may see you in in a month or two. But I want you to understand that, look, they devoted, that they devoted themselves not only to hearing a sermon, but they devoted themselves to each other. And then it says not only that, not just spending time in deep life and deep connection, but also they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which meant what? Remember what Minky Lee said in his book? Remember what Jesus was trying to do? And it says they committed themselves to the breaking of bread, to what? To the ending of hostility? to the making of a covenant, and to the forming of a community. For them, that uh, that was communion for them. And they devoted themselves, that if they had issues with each other, look, we're going to come around the Lord's table and we're going to end this hostility. Look, we're going to make a covenant because you know what? Because we're family. And they devoted themselves to that. And then lastly, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. And that makes sense, right? Of course, we, they would, these early Christians would be devoted to prayer. But did you notice the pattern of verse 42? You, you notice that none of this happened individually? That it all happened in the context of community. That God was calling them to live this out in the context of community. And listen, because of what they did in verse 42, verse 43 happened. All right, so check out verse 43. It says, because of what was going on in verse 42, because of the community that, that, that was going on, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. And this word together, when it's translated, it means for the same. They were for the same purpose and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Look, that's cray cray. That I would sell my car to help you out. That I would sell of my possessions. That I would sell a house. People were selling houses, that the book of Acts tells us, in order to help people that were in need. That was the type of community they were having. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread, there's that phrase again, in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So I want you to notice that what took place in the remaining verses, 43 to 47, happened because of what was going on in verse 42. Now, I want you to notice also something very important. Who's the they that the writer Acts keeps referring to? Look, it wasn't just the 11 disciples that were left. It wasn't just the the 100 plus that were at the upper room that were these early Christians. It was these 3,000 people that just recently became followers of Jesus. And what's the very first thing that God sends them into? What's the very first thing that Jesus, uh, that, that God, that the, the lead, that the leading of the Holy Spirit leads these early believers to? Notice that God didn't write, notice that the writer of, um, of Acts didn't say, okay, now that you're a follower of Jesus, now that you're a brand new believer, okay, we'll see you next week at, 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 at Sunday school. No, notice that, that God didn't say, look, I, I want you to go home and I want you to go to your local Christian bookstore and, and, and buy the latest Andy Stanley book, the latest Charles Stanley book. Don't forget to pick up the new uh, Elevation CD and we'll see you at Christmas. And we'll see you at Easter. Notice that, that God didn't say, look, don't forget to have quiet time every day. Again, look, we, look, we know that's important. We know that, look, you should be reading your Bible and praying at home. We, we know it, it's okay to, to, to listen to your favorite worship to D or, or CD or favorite preacher online. I'm not saying that's wrong. But notice that God didn't send them to live faith out individually. 
the very first thing that God called these brand new believers into was the local church. It was the local church. And for a lot of us, what church has become is just this time-stamped experience. Right? It's become a checkbox. From kids to teenagers to adults. That, hey, as long as I attend here and there, again, it's not about attendance. But it becomes, community has become just this time-stamped experience. That as long as I get it in sometime this year, I'm, I'm good to go. Because, look, I'm listening to my favorite preacher online. And I want you to notice that it didn't say that they added to, their, to, their, to the faith that, that people were being, uh, that lives were being changed because the disciples were preaching every day. Again, that was good, right? Because look, that's how 3,000 people got saved. So preaching has its place. You need to have God's word being spoken over you. But notice that it didn't say that it was because of the disciples preaching every single day that people got added uh, to the faith. It said it was because of them meeting together that lives were being changed daily. So what happened to that community? Where is that the disconnection? And, and I don't have that, that answer for you, and maybe what we will never, we'll never know. Well, one author, not, not in regards to Christianity, just in general, in regards to followers of Jesus or not, one author said it's, it's because of modern conveniences. He, he, he talked about, and this is kind of silly, but look, it's so true. He talked about the invention of the air conditioner. How, how many of you used to love your central air? Come on, somebody. Love your central air. I remember growing up in Jersey, um, I, I didn't even knew, uh, know that central air existed. Like, uh, the first time that I came in contact with somebody that had central air, I was in high school, y'all. Like, I grew up with that, that big, you know, clunker of a, of a window unit that sounded like a Decepticon was, like, in your, like, sleeping in your bedroom, you know? Like, Optimus Prime was, like, breathing in your, in your bedroom. That's what I grew up with. And in high school, one of my friends who, I grew up in the inner city, and so my friend who lived in the suburbs, I, I went to his house one day to sleep over, and I was like, dude, you got air coming out of your floor. Like, you got air coming out of your walls. Like, you must be rich. Right? And, and again, so, I know that's silly, but this author says, look, it was the air conditioner. He, he says, look, back, back in the day, before uh, there was uh, any air conditioning or, or before there was air conditioners or central air or whatever, that people would hang out in their porches, sipping their sweet tea and their lemonade and, and just hanging out and just doing life together. And as people walked by, they would start up conversations and they would just do life. But when the air conditioner was invented and you bought one, no longer were you sitting on your front porch and talking to your neighbor. Now you are inside. And again, rightly so, right? So it's obviously air conditioning is not a sin. But he said, look, it's this modern convenience. He even talked about the, the privacy fence. The privacy fence. Not, not the fence, to, the four-foot fence or five-foot fence that keeps your dog in its yard. He talked about the, the privacy fence that keeps everybody else from looking into your house or your, or your backyard. I, I remember the house where we came from back in Clayton, where Trudy and I uh, lived, we, we lived in a townhouse community. And so one neighbor to our, to our right, they were connected to us, but you could still put up a fence if you wanted to, but they, they never did. Uh, but the person that moved in uh, to the left of us, there was a little alleyway that separated us, but the, our houses were still pretty close. Like we can see like in each other's living room window, that's how close we were and, and know what was going on. And so when this new person came in, and, and, and moved in, the very first interaction we had with them, the first conversation that we had with this, with this lady was uh, her knocking on our door or ringing our do doorbell and asking us if we can sign this HOA paper so she can put up a privacy fence. That was the first conversation. And we're like, oh yeah, you know, no problem, of course. We thought maybe it was for a dog, you know, to keep a dog in in her backyard. And then all of a sudden, weeks later, these guys come in and put up this privacy fence. And I'm not kidding you, it was like eight to 10 feet tall. Like it was like, it's like she created her own compound. Like Trudy and I thought like she was growing weed or something, you know, back there because we never saw her, never talked to her. But our other neighbor, the ones that didn't have, uh, that didn't have a fence between us, we actually got to know them really well. They were around our age and we actually got married just two months apart. Both Trudy and Nicole got pregnant around the same time. 
Journey was born July 23rd. Will was born a week later, August 1st. And we ended up doing a little bit of life with them. And Trudy and Nicole became good friends and our babies hung out you know, together when they were home. And again, nothing wrong with a privacy fence, right? Some of us need it, but it's just, it's just making a point. How about online shopping? Remember when you used to go to the mall to shop, right? Remember when you used to actually go into Walmart, right? Like I love, um, the, before we moved here, we used to, Trudy and I would do the majority of our grocery shopping through Walmart, through Walmart online. And we got so used to that, that I would go into like a depression if I had to go inside, y'all. Like it was just that bad, right? Like I, just, I, I don't want to go into the lines. Customer service wasn't that great. But when they did the, the online, you know, grocery shopping, and I just, I'd even have to get out of my car. I would just press the button that lifts up my truck. They would put, I wouldn't even say hi to the person. They would just come in, you know, put my groceries. They would close the door and I was out, right? So, so I look, I get it. I get it. And lastly, social media. It talks about social media. And look, social media, nothing's wrong with that. I use it, we all use it. But how many of us, instead of calling up a friend on their birthday or uh, catching up with somebody who you haven't talked to in a while, instead of going to lunch with that person, going to coffee with that person, going to the hospital and visiting, you know, their, their brand new, you know, baby, you just put, you just post happy birthday or like, 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 that's all we do, right? Because our friendships have been reduced to a button. Our friendships have been reduced. Our community has been reduced to a, a post. Okay, and we all do, I do, we all do it, but I, like, I get it, it's just these modern conveniences. What if the verse that we just read in Acts chapter two read something like this? And I found this on the internet. What if it read this? The Christians were devoted to themselves and occasionally got to church when they had time. No one was filled with awe because there were no signs and wonders performed by the believers. Very few of the believers were together and had, and they had almost nothing in common because they had no real time for each other. If they sold something, they used the money to buy something better for themselves. They ate on the run, kept to themselves, and were too rushed to enjoy one another or give praise to God. They claimed to love God, but they didn't really love each other, and they felt very empty and alone. As a result, most people dislike them and very few people were saved. Imagine it read like that. Now, I know that's exaggerated. But the truth is, a lot of us are living just like that. For a lot of us, look, that's our faith. For a lot of us, look, that's our Christianity. So listen, here's the good news. Look, we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live that way. So the alternative of living like that is a life lived in community. But what's the other alternative if you don't? And I know this is, this doesn't apply to everybody, but I want you to understand what's, what's at stake sometimes in people's lives. I found this story from the Los Angeles Times. A story of former actress Yvette Vickers. Now, I never heard of Yvette Vickers, but after reading the article, I'm like, okay, I know who she is now. And many of you maybe have never heard that name. Some of you, you may have recognized that name. But Yvette Vickers was best known for her role in The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. She would have been 83 when she died. Listen to this. But nobody knows exactly how old she was when she died. Because according to the Los Angeles coroner's report, she lay dead for a better part of a year before a neighbor and fellow actress, a woman named Susan Savage, noticed cobwebs and yellow letters in her mailbox. Savage reached through a broken window to unlock the door and pushed her way through the piles of junk mail and mounds of clothing that barricaded the house. Upstairs, she found Vickers' body mummified near a heater that was still running. Her computer was on too. Its glow permeated the empty space. The Los Angeles Times posted a story headline. Mummified body of former actress Yvette Vickers found in her Benedict Canyon home, which quickly went viral. Within two weeks, Vickers' lonesome death was already the subject of uh, 16,000 Facebook posts and over 881 tweets. She had long been a horror movie icon, a symbol of Hollywood's capacity to exploit our most basic fears in the silliest ways. But now, she's an, but now she was an icon 
for a new and different kind of horror, our growing fear of loneliness. Certainly, she received much more attention in death than she did in her final years of her life. With no children, no religious group, no immediate social circle of any kind, she had begun as an elderly woman to look elsewhere for companionship. Savage later told Los Angeles Magazine that she had searched Vickers' phone bills for clues about the life that led to such an end. In the months before her grotesque death, grotesque death, Vickers had made some calls not to friends, not to family, but to distant fans who had found her through fan conventions and internet sites that said, we should get together sometime. It's been too long. Call me. Look, that's why it's so crucial. I'm not saying that's going to happen to, to everybody. But look, that's, that's the alternative sometimes. When we decide to just live life alone, it just gets away from us. In the book of Matthew, it's going to be on the screen behind me, Matthew chapter 18. Again, Jesus talks about the importance of community. He says this, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together, everybody say together, in my name, I am there in their midst. That phrase, I am, when it's translated in the original, in the original language, means to exist. And the word midst to be there in their midst, when it's translated, it means this, in the middle of that gathering. So what Jesus was actually saying was this, for where, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I exist in the middle of that gathering. I exist in the middle of that gathering. So Pastor G, what are you saying? That if I start attending church more, if my kid starts attending youth group more, if my, if my, if my younger child starts attending you know, uh, kids' church more, if, if I start attending you know, Sunday school excuse me, more, if, if, I, if, my mari- if I go to the marriage class, then my life's going to change. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Potentially, yes. Yes. And several years ago, I wouldn't agree, with, uh, I wouldn't agree to that. But I've come to find out that, that statement is so true. You see, in the book of James, and it's, it's not on the screen, but James tells us to confess our sins one to, uh, one to another so we can find healing. And so as we come together, as we gather together in these programs, in these events, that your marriage, that your teenager, that your kid, that your, that your young adult has a better chance, that their faith has a better chance of surviving, that your marriage has a better chance of surviving, that your, that your teenager, that your kid has a better, their faith has a better chance of surviving, your, your young adult has a, their faith has a better chance of surviving in that community than alone. Now, I may not, I'm not saying that a program is going to fix your child, but listen, they got a better chance. Why? Because it's not about the program, and it's not even about the speaker or, the, or the, the youth pastor or the kids pastor or the Sunday school teacher, but it's what? It's the presence of God that exists in the middle of that gathering. I remember, I remember for me, it was when I was 13 at a, at a district youth camp that God just changed my life the, the, the summer before I went into high school. Never been to an altar before. And, and I, I don't even remember what that preacher preached. But I remember running to that altar and just sobbing before God. And I never cried before in church or, or really liked that. I'm like, I don't even know what's going on. But God, I just, I just give you my life. I just surrender. Like, if, if that's Christianity, I, I want that. And it was in that moment among other people, listening to a message in that gathering. And look, I grew up in church. But it was in that moment that I experienced something different. It was in that moment when the Lord just changed my life, and I believe that's when it began for me, even the call to ministry. Now, I remember for even my best, uh, for my best friend growing up, same thing. Who was the pastor's son, my best friend growing up. I didn't realize he was on the other side of that altar in the same youth camp, and God called him to be a worship leader. 
And at the last church we, where I was at, we were actually associate pastors together. And again, it wasn't because of a, a district camp. It wasn't because of the speaker. But it was because of the presence of God that I got to experience there in community. Now listen, now I know that, that God can meet you individually. So look, I'm not saying that he can't. I remember another college, uh, college friend, his name was Nolly. And I remember him telling me about his story, how he came to faith. That he, was, he was driving down this highway and he was listening to his favorite preacher on, on the radio. And God just spoke to his heart and just began to cry and sob. And he, and he pulled over on the side of the road and in the ditch, he said he kneeled down and that's when his life just changed. And then God called him to Bible college and that's where I met him. And so yes, look, God will meet you individually. Yes, God will do things in your life individually. I'm not saying that. But, but God does something different when we come together when we come together. Greg Olden, uh, who wrote the book Transforming Discipleship, he said this, to be a follower of Christ is to understand that there is no such thing as solo discipleship. That there's no such thing as solo discipleship. That if you read the Bible, even just, or, or just the New Testament, there's not much talk of your individual relationship with God. You won't find much talk of that. But what fills the pages of the Bible, what fills the pages of the New Testament is this talk, is this theology of community. You see, Jesus actually came and flipped this upside down. Jesus came and flipped the religious system when he broke into human history. Because up to that point, there was, there was this chant, there was this saying that if you were a good Jew, you, you, would, you would constantly say almost every day, and, and, it was, and it was called the Shema. And the Shema was basically found, it was a verse from, from Deuteronomy that said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And it actually began with saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord is God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And what did Jesus say when he was asked what's the greatest commandment? Right, he was repeating the Shema from Deuteronomy. And he said, yeah, look, look, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Yeah, it's the greatest commandment. But the next one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And what Jesus was saying essentially is that you can't love God and be in relationship with God without being in a relationship with others. And when he said that it was flipping the religious system around, that it was no longer just you and your relationship with God, now it was you, your relationship with God, and your relationship to others, and they were connected. And Jesus was the one who established that. So as we get ready to close, if, if I can get somebody at the, at the piano, our, our last verse that I want us to look at, to drive, let me just land this plane and drive, drive this home in Hebrews chapter 10. And again, it's going to be on the screen uh, right behind me. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, verse 19. Now I want you to notice the writer of Hebrew, his, the language that he uses. It's, it's, it's like it's intentional, what he says. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 19 says this. It says, therefore, brothers, and you can put sisters in there. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for you, no, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since you, it doesn't say that, right? It says, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let you, it says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith and having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23 let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up 
meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So here Paul was saying, look, that your faith journey was never meant to be alone. Not only is your, is your faith journey not meant to be alone, he said, I want you to remember that you've been forgiven together. He goes on to remind them of what Jesus did in their lives. Look, you're not forgiven just individually. It's not just between, it's just not you and God thing. It's that you remember you've been forgiving, you've been forgiven together. And he says, look, don't give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing, right? Things that haven't changed. It's still a habit today. He said, don't give up on meeting together. He said, look, take, take notice. Spur one another in, into, into good works, into good deeds. Look out for one another as the day is approaching. In other words, he said, look, take notice. Take notice of that single mom or that single dad that comes in and their kids are just wide open every week and they're just barely making it. You hear the writer of Hebrews saying, look, look, just take notice of the person that, that just sits by themselves week in and week out and just sits, comes, and then leaves. Nobody talks to them. To take notice of that teenager who, who takes 22 cookies from the cafe. That you may think it's obnoxious, but that may be the only meal that he gets that day. He says, look, take notice. Take notice of that marriage that's struggling. Take notice of that family that's struggling financially. Take notice of that teenager. Take notice of that kid. And don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So here's, here's the bottom line. Here's the, the one thing I want you to remember as you, as you go home today, and it's going to be on the screen. You are a community away from changing the course of your destiny. You are a community away from changing the course of your destiny. Listen, your marriage is a community away from surviving. Your finances are a community away from getting out of debt. Your teenager, look, is a community away from finding Jesus. Your little kid is a community away from finding Jesus. Some of you, you're a community away from breaking that addiction. Some of you are a community away from breaking depression. Some of you here as adults are a community away today from coming to know Jesus and his friendship. George Guthrie, who wrote a commentary on, on Hebrews, he said this. He says, as different parts of the human body need the resources and abilities supplied by the other parts, so those in the body of Christ cannot exist apart from the rest of the body. Our identity in Christ is a corporate identity in which we are individuals meaningfully related to the whole. Neither are we self-made nor self-maintained. We need each other. So I have one action step for you as we get ready to close. Just one, one, one thing I want you to start doing, and it's this. It's find people who you can experience life and faith with. What's the action step? What, what, what do I do? What's my next step from here? That's it. Find a Sunday school class. Find a small group. Find, find our youth group. Find our kids' church. Find that finance class. Sign up for, 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 for a Berean. Just get plugged in. Get involved. It may not change in a day. It may not change in a week. But God said, like, I'll be there in my presence. You're going to experience my presence, and you're going to have a better chance in those moments than you would alone. Let's pray.